why do I need God? Well, we're going to get a gentle proposal to that answer from a channel called I'm Baker. I think that's how you say it. It's a 10 minute video. I've only seen three minutes. It's the first time I've ever heard of this channel. Although I did search to make sure no one else had responded to it. And it looks like Paula Gia just responded to a different video a few weeks ago. So I'm sure many of you know about this channel, but I did not. It has almost 300,000 subscribers. It's really well done videos, which is cool. But based off what I saw in the first three minutes, I think we're going to have a lot to respond to here. By the way, I'm Brandon. This is Mind Shift. This is a Tuesday takedown episode, never of people, not against the creator of that channel, just against bad ideas, bad arguments, and bad apologetics. Here's the video. I think a lot of us will say, well, I'm a good person. I try to be a good person and I can figure stuff out on my own. And I got a good family, good friends, good life, all of which I did on my own, by the way. So what the heck do I need God for? Honestly, this used to be me. I'm sure that there are people like this, and he claims to have been one of them, but I always see it as kind of a caricature of people that don't believe in God or don't consider themselves religious. Oh, I'm so self-sufficient. Look at everything I've been able to do for me. I'm the best. I've taken care of everything in my life. What do I even need God for? And the fact is most people, I think, if you really asked them about their life and their family and their job and their success, they would attribute it to all kinds of other influences and people in their life that have helped them and community and friendship and opportunity and many, many things besides this selfish ideal, which is somehow how most Christians try to represent the non-believer, the non-Christian, the non-religious. That it is out of our arrogance, our own ego, that we can't even fathom why we would need a God. I wouldn't go so far as to say it is a straw man, because again, I'm sure there are people like this, but I think he's overgeneralizing here to a very large degree. And I also don't know anyone who has rejected God because they think they can do it themselves. Again, it's just like Christians cannot understand people really don't believe in this God. So I just think that this first part is starting us off on the wrong foot. But let's see where it goes from here. Don't worry, I'm not going to sit here and just say, oh, you need God because you're going to hell or you need to be saved. Because if somebody said that to me when I was at that stage... Let's just say that wouldn't have gone over very well. And I probably would have shut the door to God forever. How interesting. And I think this is his whole point is he's going to give us a gentle proposal. But is this not the proposal from Jesus himself? Serve me or else. Follow me or else. Love and obey me or else. And it's not just a barrier to entry. It's if you don't enter, you are kicked out and not just kicked out, but imprisoned for life and tortured forever. That is the gospel message. What's the good news? That you don't have to burn in hell forever. Who is Jesus? The Savior. What is he saving us from? Death and hell. I continue to see Christians more and more go down this road of just representing the positive parts of the gospel, but you cannot have one without the other. Also, I think very telling here, he says that if someone had done that to him at that stage, it wouldn't have gone over well. Oh, so there is a stage where you do drop that bomb. Just it's not the entry level stage because first you have to win them over. First, you have to show them the pros and get them hooked before you show them the cons once they're in too far. Got it. Another word for that is manipulation. And if you want to hear me talk more about that, you can check out my recent video on Christianity's calculated kindness. Okay, what's next? But instead, I hope this to be more like a proposal or an open invitation to something that I just really, really love. So just hear me out and then take it or leave it. It's totally up to you. Again, this has that air of you send yourself to hell kind of a thing. Like, hey, I'm just going to tell you what I love. I'm just going to brag about my amazing relationship with the creator of the universe and how I know that he personally loves me. And hey, if that's not for you, that's not for you, right? It's almost condescending. We think we're physical creatures seeking just some short experience of the spiritual. But in reality, we're spiritual creatures living just some short experience of the physical. Now, I don't care who you are, what you believe. I'm sure that resonates with every single one of us because I think we all know it, whether we believe in it or not, that there has to be something else that goes way beyond just get born, go to school, go to work, have a family and die. There has to be. No, there doesn't. And no, not everyone has this same idea. And no, we don't all 
know this. That is the loosest way of using the word no. Do some people feel this way? Sure. Do some people hope for this? Absolutely. No one knows, not even me. Maybe we are spiritual creatures trapped in a very temporary body, but it's not my fault if that is the only thing we can actually observe and detect. And some sense of awe when looking out at the vastness of the universe doesn't mean there is inherently more. Why do I need to make up these terms that there's some essence in me that goes past what we can observe is our actual ability to be cognizant, our neural activity, call it something poetic like the soul or the spirit, and then say, that's our true self. That's what's really going on here. That's going to go so much further than everything else. Maybe. And it's pretty to think about sometimes in some ways. Again, it's amazing how quickly we can leave the Bible behind in these discussions. Because for most spirits or souls that have ever existed, they're going to be tortured forever or at best completely wiped out, just according to the Bible itself. From a agnostic philosophical point of view, yeah, it's really interesting. Is there more experience after the brain ceases to function? I don't know. Seems unlikely. Could be though. Could be a bunch of things. Could be we wake up from the simulation. Could be we take off the really advanced VR goggles. Could be we were an alien having a weird dream. Like there are so many things other than religion, other than this particular religion, and other than this particular religion's particular heaven and hell concept of an afterlife. So on one hand, he's trying to talk about like, oh, there's more, there's this openness, there's this unknown, there's this questioning, and here's what it points to, my specific text and the ideas that it proposes. And to me, that's just so silly. Like we went very big and unknown, and really what he's pointing to is something very small and specific. I could talk about this point forever, but I'm sure he's going to say more. So let's just see what else he says. And this isn't just wishful thinking. I think we know it because it's our experience. We feel it in that deep inner part of ourselves that hungers for something more. That deep inner part of ourselves that hungers for something more is wishful thinking. You can't say it's not wishful thinking and then essentially describe wishful thinking. You can't say feeling it equals knowing it. It's like the worst data to go off of is how we feel. And how we feel can be manipulated. How we feel can be controlled. You can be having the worst day ever where you feel more depressed and anxious than you've ever been and it's your blood sugar levels. You can be in a state for 20 years and take one pill and immediately have a different experience, different feelings. To say that what we feel and, and this quest for more is somehow innate and thus proves a particular truth is an overclaim by a thousand miles. So yes, I think it is absolutely wishful thinking. Every single one of us is made up of both the physical and the spiritual. Now our physical bodies hunger for the physical, touch, food, water, warmth. And when we get these, we feel happy. But if we don't, our bodies feel sick and slowly die. Now in the same way, our spirit or soul or whatever you want to call it, hungers for the spiritual. Before we get into what the spirit hungers for, we have a body and we have bodily needs. Yes, we know this. We can observe this. We can test this and it's repeatable. We know, generally speaking, what happens if one doesn't get water or food, proper shelter, or yes, even touch. That again, we can understand and can explain and have good evolutionary purposes. But again, I guess we're just going to have to, for this video, grant him this additional knowledge that he has of we are made up of both body and spirit. So the body longs for these things. And again, even using the word like hungers for or longs for, no, it's just an absolute necessity. And to be part of the population that is still around is because we have those innate drives and instincts to get the things that allow us to live, not even to benefit or thrive. These are just baseline requirements, which I imagine he's going to tell us what our spiritual baseline requirements are. And I'm sure this will be grounded in excellent scientific research. And by the way, I understand a lot of this video is already shaping up to be what we can know versus what we don't know. And I'm fine, even if all of this existed, but we just can't claim that it does. And even people that believe in the spirit or soul Oh, they can't even agree. What does the spirit need most? How does a soul thrive? Ask that to a thousand Christians and you'll have hundreds of different answers. This is the thing. I'm not saying science is the 
only answer and it's always perfect and it's always right. And that if we can't prove something, it's inherently wrong. No, it just means that. It means we can't prove it. It means we don't know. This is extremely abstract thinking and he's saying it as if it's agreed upon fact. That's my pushback here, especially because we know he's not just saying it in this anything goes all paths to heaven, nirvana, bliss, happiness kind of way. He loves, serves, and obeys the Christian God. So this is just problematic to me, but let's see what the spirit needs. Truth, as in those answers every single one of us are looking for. Love, as in every single one of us longs to be loved. But even deeper than that, I think we all hunger just to be accepted. And goodness, as in every single one of us wants to be good and wants what is good. And we all think we know what that is. But often we find out down the road that what we thought was good wasn't actually good for us at all. And when we get these things, we feel joy, which is different from happiness. Truth, love, and good. Those are things that people sometimes like. Does everyone want truth? No. A lot of people want to feel good. So there's a hierarchy even happening between some of these things. Would you rather know all the secrets of the universe or have a loving relationship if you could truly only have one? Different people would choose different things. Sometimes people's quest for truth has cost them their opportunity at love. Sometimes people have been so constrained by their love or attachments or in the negative form of these things dependencies that they're unwilling to seek out truth. We see so many people stay in religions and even if we're going to go with this guy here, Christianity, is true. He should be able to admit that there are absolutely people then in Islam who maybe have an understanding of why the Quran is not a perfect inspired book, who maybe see the faults in the Prophet Muhammad, but they'd rather stick with their culture out of a sense of needing to be accepted, like he listed, that was maybe even more powerful than love itself. And so they deny truth. Not all people want truth. Not all people want good. And as he pointed out, Many people don't agree on what good is or think they know what good is only to have been deceived. This seems like a huge problem from the moral lawgiver. After all, this video is a proposal about why we need God. If good people through their spirit seeking out what good is and thinking they know it have a different interpretation than everyone else, so much for the law being written on our hearts. If we can think we know good in earnestly seeking it even under the right God and right religion, but still be deceived? Tell me again why I need this God so that I can not be deceived because they're going to show me perfect truth. Let's look at the Bible. Let's look at God's claims. Did we get that? Do any Christians agree after now having this God? They all accepted the proposal. They all believe in the same God. They all have roughly the same source material, and yet they can't even agree on what is good, what is moral, what is right. I'll point out two of my favorite videos that I've done. We have God's not objective morality and designed to be deceived. These are two huge roadblocks to thinking that the reason we need God is so he can help us with moral goods. Happiness comes from something on the outside. Joy comes from something on the inside. But when we don't, our souls feel sick and slowly die. And that's what we feel in that inner emptiness or restlessness of heart. So the soul can die while we're still alive or it's just in the process of dying because that's what it is to be without God. Like, What is the point here? This is just, again, a bunch of really abstract talking about non verifiable concepts where, yes, it sounds good and you can say anything you want, but it doesn't have to actually mean anything. And that's why I think things like this are so useless, except if you are someone who feels empty or searching or wandering or hurt. And then you might think, oh, there's a solution. There's an answer. Yes, I identify like feeling like my soul, my essence is diminishing. Oh, that's the God hole and only God can fill it. And yet how many Christians feel this way? How many believers of any kind of religion feel this way? If the case he's making and he hasn't made it yet, so I'll be fair. But if the case is, this is why you need God to save your soul, to be joyful, to be happy. Not only is that just a false promise because we've seen so much evidence of this not being the case for Christians once they give their life to Jesus or say the sinner's prayer or commit or join a discipleship program or under understand the word better or whatever the prescription is. It's also not biblical. He cares about his will being done at your expense here on earth. Anyone that is trying to sell Christianity as a solution to your feelings is inherently unbiblical, generally incorrect, and a snake oil salesman. Now, I know some of you are thinking, yeah, but why are these things spiritual? Well, ask yourself, are these things 
in their most perfect, purest form, something we've invented or something we discover. For example, math. One plus one equals two is still true, even if there were no universe. So math is something we discover, not something we invented, but it has to come from somewhere. I think he's beginning to get a little lost in his own video here. He starts by asking about these three things, love, truth, and good. How do we know they're of the spirit and not the body? And then he says, ask yourself in their purest form, are they something that we invented or something that we discovered? As if, if we only discovered it, that means that they're innate to the spirit and not the body. Ask yourself, is food something we discovered or invented, right? Food being one of the things the body needed. Well, food is just an energy source. There's different ways to get that energy source and anything that provides us that energy source we've labeled as food, like labeling plus and minus for math. We invented a language to describe the phenomenon. I don't see this distinctly separate. It's like he's trying to put these things in terms of organic and non-organic. Oh, organic, things that are found locally, things that seem natural to us are things for the the body. So the opposite of that, things that are more abstract, truth, good, love, these are the things that always existed, the things we've discovered. Well, if you can discover those, let me ask you this, was hate invented or discovered? Well, let me get out of this by saying hate is the absence of love. Nope. That's not true. We'll do a whole video about why that kind of argument doesn't work. There's abstract negative things as well. So were they inherent? Have they always been? Were they things that we discovered? Again, this is something, and I'm not saying he's necessarily doing it, because again, one, I'm interrupting a lot and I haven't seen the fruition of it, and two, I can't know his mind or his motives here, but many Christians will do this. They will try to make these categories and attribute some of them to God. God is good. God is love. Therefore, God is the creator of good and love, and good and love do not exist without this God, and therefore we cannot obtain them, and our soul needs them. We can get food on our own because that's somehow not of God, or that's a after creation. That's something we were able to come along and help out with, and therefore, yeah, sure, we can have some dominion over that, but never morals, never truth, never good. But then they never want to look at dishonesty, harm, or hate. Those, even though they're of the same abstract nature, they move over here to the human category. Oh, we did those things. We corrupted God's perfect truth, perfect love, and perfect good to create those. I don't see how this works. This is like the most cherry-picking thing I can think of. Now, there are three levels in life, and every single one of us wants what is best or what is higher. We're just built that way. Now, the bottom level is all about the carnal, pleasure, vanity, feeding my senses. As long as it looks good and I feel good doing it, then I don't really care about anything else. The second level is the level of intellectual enlightenment, all human knowledge, the arts and sciences, culture and society, humanity and the common good. Now this level is much more grand than the first, but it only goes as far as our human understanding. The third level is the level of the spiritual, basically everything else that goes beyond what we can see and touch and beyond all our human understanding. This is where we find the source of pure truth that every single one of our minds was designed to seek, of pure love that every single one of our hearts was made to be filled with and to share, and the pure, perfect good that every single one of our souls desires. Spirit can only come from spirit, and this First pure spirit is where we come from, which explains why we sometimes feel homesick for something that we don't even know what it is. Okay, put it in a poem and call it a question and I'm fine with it. Putting it in your proposal of why we absolutely need this God and claiming it as truth is simply unfair. Again, there's no facts here. We're not dealing with anything tangible. All you've done is create another level that no one can either arrive at know they've arrived at, or if they claim they have arrived there, there's no way to demonstrate it. And how unfair to the vast majority of people that have ever lived, whose 
first and only job in life was to find food to satiate themselves for the day lest they die, who was more preoccupied with trying to evade capture by an enemy group than they were the arts and crafts of the second level. These are privileges that we have been able to obtain by creating enough peace, relatively speaking, for a long enough period of time to have interest, hobbies, passions, and the time and money to do so. And though I appreciate all of those things and I am very happy to be the beneficiary of living in a time and place where I can enjoy this, make a video like this, have the freedom and the technology to do so, to say that it is somehow higher, it depends. It depends on a lot of things, a lot of definitions, a lot of concepts of what is real and what is not, how we can know what is real and what is not, right? He's just so out on a limb here. And again, I wouldn't even go as far as to say it's all inherently wrong. Everything he has said so far could actually be the case, but I find it useless if we can't know that it's the case. See, at some point, he's going to have to back this up to how he knows these things to be true. And it's going to come down to one of a couple things, because he arrived at the third level of spiritual enlightenment and now understands these things. And then it would seem like he's just casting his pearls before swine, trying to tell people in the first two levels about it, which has always been the problem with this kind of revelation. Or he's going to tell you he knows it because he read it from a holy book of God that told us we can know these things. And if you just read it right or have the correct interpretation or the correct understanding or have the witness of the Holy Spirit dwelling in you already somehow to understand these things, but how did you get the Holy Spirit's witness before you understood these things? That's a real catch-22 in and of itself, but it's going to boil back to something like this. So it's fun and fine to kind of talk about these abstract possibilities if we could consider them that and understand that they're opinions at the end of the day. But as soon as you claim it to be an absolute fact or truth, and then the best you can do is back it up to experience or down to a book that we can say is falsifiable, that we can definitely with good reason question the validity of, it's going to fall apart like the house of cards that it is. And honestly, guys, there's a little part of me that hates critiquing this. There is a poet in me that loves stuff like this. It's probably why I was hooked in Christianity for three decades. I'm a wanderer. I'm a questioner. I love the potential, the possible. I'm a seeker. My favorite things to discuss and think about are these big philosophical concepts. That's not true for everyone, by the way, right? He's put everyone in this camp like him and maybe like me that is this kind of a searcher or seeker, you know how many people don't care at all? I'll tell you how many. Go look at a popular cooking channel or Taylor Swift fans. See the popularity with things like that versus philosophy channels. We just know people don't care. And you can say, oh, they're stuck on that first place of the carnal pleasure. They're wasting their life away with these things they care about. That's real. It's tangible. Who's to say what's more important? We're all just bent a little bit different. As soon as one person claims this is the only way, this is what it all means, this is what we're here for, oh, so things are getting pretty dicey. Just got to shake it off. Now, if we live our lives down here in the basement, we're bored, miserable, and we don't get anywhere. Bored because any pleasure done in repetition only leads to boredom. Any pleasure done in repetition only leads to boredom? Uh-oh. See my heaven video. Miserable, because we're searching for all these things and things where clearly they can't be found. If your child is starving to death and someone provides a way out for you, or you now have an opportunity to make money to avoid these outcomes, that's more real joy and happiness than any art on the second level, than any spiritual truth on the third level. Acting like this first level of carnal, even saying the word carnal, it's so inherently negative. The connotations are not fair. They're acting like we're on temptation island or something. These are what we require. And it is only from an insane position of privilege to call that some derogatory level of the lowest self in trying to get those needs met. And I think that there is a threshold, right? They've even done scientific studies, something like in this number has probably vastly changed in the last few years since the study, but it was like after 79,000, it was kind of this tipping point. Life got better, 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 and better as you approached making that much money. And then after that, it was like, ah, maybe I'm now spending too much time at work and I don't get as much time with the family. And the whole reason I got the job in the first place was to provide some stability for the family, but now I'm chasing this. So yes, can anyone err on any of these sides? Of course. But to say that going after these things in general is inherently negative, wrong, or incorrect, or immature, 
also wrong. Nuance. That's going to be my first piece of merch. All you're going to see is my mug and the word nuance. That's not true. I'm never going to put my face out there like that. That's why we need to create the perfect logo. You guys, I need help. I love my old logo too, but I am not going to put something on merch that now has been pointed out to me over and over and over again, resembles a Nazi swastika. And yes, I'm aware that that symbol existed before the Nazis took it, but that's not what people think of. So let's continue on. Now I'd say most of us probably live here. And we're good, loving, intelligent people, more or less. Because there's all the shades of these things here, but never in their fullness. And we live comfortable lives in our comfortable homes watching Netflix and ball games, and we're happy. Enough. But deep down, there's still a dullness. Something's still missing. And we ask ourselves, is this all there is? And inevitably, we find ourselves at the crossroads, where we start searching for this or go back down here. I think there are actually very few of us who live here. I wish I could say I'm one of them, but I'm not. I think like many of us, I fight my battles on all three. But I know it's there and I know it's real. And once we get just the tiniest little glimpse of it, we're like, that's it. That's what I need. And you can tell right away the people who do live here because they're marked with an unshakable peace. That's not of this world. And they're the most attractive people we'll ever meet in our lives. So many absolute statements. I will go ahead and give him credit that he's not claiming to always live in the top, that he struggles like everyone else. Oh, it's almost like there's this thing that is the human condition that sometimes is so focused on what we need that we can't really put our heads above the clouds. And then there is the part of comfortability where we have enough, but maybe we get bored or maybe we want more and greed sets in or whatever it is. Or maybe it's just this existential dread that is always looming, that always makes us wonder, have I done enough? Have I left my mark? Is there meaning in my life? All of these things. Like I'm not denying that any of these questions are not real or even beneficial questions to be asking ourselves. But then he makes this jump, this new claim that there are people that can live on that third floor and you'll know it because of that perfect peace, that attraction. You want what they have. And I'm not all that old or all that wise, but I've been around long enough and I know enough to know that I've seen people that many people would think are on that third floor and I've seen them fall. I don't know anyone that has lived a life with that perfect peace. First of all, Christians are supposed to be told, on one hand, that there is a peace that surpasses all understanding. And then they're also told that they're going to be sufferers for Christ in this world. And maybe knowing that, and knowing the goodness of that leads them to that perfect peace and joy. And that's the difference between happiness and joy. Like, I understand the claim. And yes, I'm just talking about my anecdotal experience, but I don't know anyone. I know people that think they've had these incredible encounters with the Lord and fast forward two years later and they watch four hours of Netflix a day and they've got the same gripes and problems as everyone else. What happened? life. I know people that have done psychedelics and man, it blew their mind and it looked like they really discovered something. They really lost their ego. They really found the truth. And maybe their life has improved overall and Christianity can do this. There's a lot of things that can improve our life. But to say that anyone is just on this tipping point of perfect truth, love, and good all the time is irrational. They are still subject to everything else. Take away food from any of these people for four days and see how it goes. Mess with their neurochemistry and see how it goes. And yeah, there are some amazing human specimens out there. People that have dealt with loss and suffering and self-sacrifice in a way that is beyond impressive and extremely attractive. They're just on a different end of the spectrum. That's, I think, something that's way more fair. There is a spectrum of human existence, of human cognitive abilities, of human perceptions and philosophies on how to live this life. And it's not bad versus good. It's a spectrum of differences. And some differences look beneficial or more positive or more attractive to different people or different groups and different time frames and cultures for different reasons. He's acting like everyone who has ever existed and who has ever been born has aimed at this same thing and finds value in this same ideal. It's simply not the case. It's historically, religiously, and philosophically ignorant. But it has to be part of like the Christian message of there's something missing, there's something better. You can't do it on your own 
enough. Only God can. That's why you're not enough and you need God. Now let me tell you about my specific God and what he will do for you. And I'll leave that hell bit for later. First, let's get you hyped up on all the good things this religion is going to do for you, which is still an incorrect biblical message. It's just astounding to me how many ways this is incorrect. Now we can get from here to here on our own with a little discipline, a blowing up of our egos, and the challenging of our minds. And we can try to get from here to here on our own, but it's hard. We're going to make a lot of mistakes, be easily deceived, and only go so far. It's so far beyond our human categories of thinking. So this is where God made it easy for us. He took all this, all truth, goodness, and love. Everything through which you and I and all of existence was created. Everything that actually is himself. And he embodied it into a human person. Here it is. We took all this abstract terminology, these philosophical concepts, these opinionated differences, we've claimed them as truth, and now we have to back that up. And here it comes in the personal work of Jesus Christ. And this is how people convert to Christianity. You don't scare them off anymore with fire and brimstone. You show them what they're missing, you play off their desires, and then you offer a solution. Who cares if that solution is accurate? Accurate. Who cares if this represents the God of the Bible? Who cares if the things they're promising you're going to get by following this person or this religion will actually happen? Who cares if there's different sects of this particular religion that believe differently about this very person that is now the sole answer for you? Who cares that this person himself, Jesus, is the one that preached about the concept of hell, not the Old Testament God? We'll forget everything we know, all the inconsistencies and contradictions and mutually exclusive claims in the Bible. We'll completely disregard how this religion first came into existence. We'll just pick and choose what makes sense. We'll forget history, we'll forget archaeology, we'll forget science, we'll make it all about your feelings. Isn't that what this whole video has been? We'll make it all about your feelings and we'll try to make you feel better if you do the thing we want you to do. And then we'll move on to the next target. And you might get a high, it might even help you with your addiction because there are catalysts that happen in people's lives that do create positive change. The problem is people not looking back on what those catalysts are, why they worked, or how it otherwise could have happened. What else is just like this? For some people, it's an amazing sexual experience. For some people, it's drugs. For some people, it's one particular friendship that was just so beautiful and changed their life. For some, it's the support of family. For some, it's religion. For some, it's philosophy. For some, it's giving back. All of these things are part of human phenomenon. We've just labeled some of them spiritual phenomenon, and then we've said of the spiritual phenomenon, it points to my particular God, here's how, and then boom, we insert our religion, and it's so small. It's with such little humility and understanding of how our brains work, how our bodies work, the psychology of people around us, different cultures, classes, etc. Like, it's... Oh, it really is frustrating to see people claim enlightened spiritual truth and then think so very small. So as I said in the beginning, I hope this to be more like an open invitation that we have our entire lives to respond to. And it doesn't come from me. And the invitation is simple. Okay. And so it ends with the invitation to what? To accept Christ. This was a Christian video by a Christian who used almost nothing biblical to make his gentle invitation for his particular religion. He used his personal experience of what it means to him, of how much he loves this God, and then a lot of abstract philosophical terms about need, desire, truth, good, and love. If I was a Christian, I would critique this video, and as a non-Christian, I'm critiquing this video. This is the kind of middle ground, watered down, Starbucks Christianity that works today. Let's not get too specific. Let's not use the Bible verses. Let's not talk about hell. Let's emotionally manipulate people into needing this God. But what if they don't need this God? We'll tell them they do. Well, what if they really don't? What if they're doing fine? We'll say there's three levels in a house 
and they're either ignorant and just circling around chasing their carnal desires, or maybe they have some level of intellectual enlightenment, but it's still self-serving. It's things just of this world, things just for themselves. And look, aren't they still a little lonely at the end of the day? Isn't there still something missing? Let's poke at the human condition that every one of us shares that has nothing to do with a missing God. When people leave it because it didn't meet any of those requirements, it didn't fill any of the gaps that it was promised to fill, we'll say it was on them. They were never truly a Christian. They want to go back to their carnal level of self-satisfaction and egotistical desire. We'll make them victims to get them in and then enemies if they disagree. This is the evangelism of Christianity, and it doesn't matter how gentle or open you say the invitation is. It's always the same nonsense. It's always the same games. We're just dressing up in a different way to appeal to a different kind of person because people, again, are on that spectrum of experience. And that spectrum has slightly shifted for newer generations that don't want to be sold into something based off fear. So we stopped using the stick so much and now we're dangling the carrot. And I think purposely leaving out Christian buzzwords because of their negative connotations. We won't even use the word heaven in this video. We'll talk about other dimensions. We'll talk about higher powers than ourselves. We'll talk about the essence of truth, love, goodness, and acceptance. We didn't need all that fluff because at the end of the day, you're basing it off of experience or the Bible and both fail miserably as proof. End of story. I'm done. Thanks for being here. Have a great day. See you on Thursday with the next Secular Bible Study Series. And until then, keep thinking. I wanted to personally thank my top tiers of support, my iconoclast and GVI, Jacob, Joe, Martin, Oliver, Perry, Rocket, and Sean, my humanist heroes, Jared and Christy, my atheist advocates, Caleb, Jeffrey, Karen, Sparky, and Todd, as well as all of my secular scholar patrons. If you believe in the mission of this channel or you just enjoy the content, please consider joining these fine people. Thanks and have a great day.